Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Spanish 101, right? <laughs> uh, let me start with this quote. Let's see if I can get this right. I dreamed and behold, I saw a girl. Uh, this is the way the pilgrim's progress starts, without the girl, of course. Uh, but this, has, this book has always been important in my life. My mother read it to me when I was a little girl. I have read it to my children now. I've seen the movies. I've read different versions. Uh, there's a very cute new version with uh, bunnies. I don't know if you've seen it. John showed it to me. So uh, I think one of the reasons I really like this book is because it portrays life as a journey where there's change, where there are mountains, hills, valleys, good days, bad days, and constant movement. And somehow my life has been like that. So as I share my journey with you through some of the symbols of this allegory, I just hope to encourage you as I um, speak about what God has done in my life. And of course, it all started in the city of destruction, a place where there's no hope, where there's no meaning, uh, where we feel empty inside. And I was very blessed to uh, be brought in a Christian family. So I met Jesus when I was eight years old, more or less. Uh, I decided to follow Jesus. But it was around, uh, it was even a little before when I fell in love with books. Uh, that's me. <laughs> uh, my grandpa, I look like my daughter, that's what they say, but <laughs> or my daughter looks like me. Uh, my grandpa had this big library. He was a missionary in Mexico. Um, that's where the Harris comes from, just if some of you are wondering. Uh, and he had this big library, and vacations for me were the highlight of the year. Not only because I could see grandma and grandpa, and not only because I could eat grandma's delicious American food, and not only because grandpa took us to rivers to swim, uh, but because there were books in that house, and I could bring back home five or six of them, and I had to promise to read them all before I returned them. Uh, and then I met the book, right? The book that changed my life, and it was Little Women. That's what worked for me. Um, I have only sisters, so of course the story was very close to me. We were three sisters. Uh, the March sisters were four, but uh, give or take. Uh, and I decided I was going to be Joe March. I just said, I'm going to write books, and that's going to be what I'm going to do forever. <laughs> but then, of course, I started growing up, and I started thinking, is this a call? Is, it, is God calling me to write? Or is this just a dream I have? It's just a fantasy. So um, a small Christian magazine in Mexico, Prisma, that, that was the name of that magazine, um, sponsored this contest. Uh, of short stories, and my mother, I was 18 at the time, and my mother encouraged me, go and send a story, send a story. So I finally sent a story, and I was sure I was not going to win, but I got third prize. And for me, 18, I was like, oh, maybe this is my call. So I go to this beautiful hotel uh, where they are having the ceremony, and they're giving the prizes. And I received my prize, which came in an envelope, a uh, white envelope, and the first thing I did, of course, was to open the the envelope and see cash inside. And for an 18 year old, that's a big thing. So I'm like, oh yes. I was already thinking what I was gonna spend the money on. But then I saw, I saw the label on uh, the envelope and it was not exactly this one, because this is a new one, but it said, MAI, Media Associates International. <laughs> They had sponsored the, the, the contest. And of course, I had no idea who Media Associates International was. Uh, I remember, because I'm not very clear, there were two American men <laughs> at hotel breakfast, and one of them was very tall, and the other was not so tall, so it was John Most and Bob Ricky. Um, but that day, I just went, got my prize, went home, right? Uh, but I, I uh, very soon, I have to be honest, very soon I fell into the slough of despot, this marshy place, this muddy place that Christian uh, experiences when he's leaving the city of destruction. Because winning a contest doesn't mean you're going to be a published writer <laughs> or that you're going to continue writing. So I started feeling very um, disappointed. I was 18, so I was studying education. That's what I do for a living. I'm a teacher. 
but I really wanted to write. But just like in the Pilgrim's Progress, I received help. Um, help as a character in the Pilgrim's Progress, but help in a general way. And that help came from this beautiful lady. Uh, her name is Liz Isais. Uh, she's now in heaven. She, is, she was the editor and the publisher of this magazine who had sponsored the, the contest. And she, um, I, I called her, an 18-year-old, my hand was shaking, there were the old phones, you know, dialing. <laughs> and, and then um, I go like, I would like to talk to you about writing. And then she told me, oh, chula, because that was her word. For those who, who know her, that was her word. Uh, it's like, dear, deary, uh, oh, dear, you will come to my office. And that was the beginning of the, one of the best seasons of my life, just being trained by this wonderful woman. I worked for her only one year and a half, but I learned, I think, what I would have learned in a university for five or six years. Um, she mentored me. She guided me. She taught me everything I had to know about punctuation, which I had no idea at the time. <laughs> right? um, her way of correcting was using the beautiful red ink uh, that some of us editors have changed to comments now on Google Docs. Right? <laughs> it's how it's not red anymore. It's Google Comments. And, well, I don't think the writers feel very excited about that either. But uh, she was just a great help. But I still, still felt there was something missing. I was writing for the magazine, I was writing testimonies, articles, but there was something missing. I really wanted to publish fiction. And I told her, I have a very small novel, and I don't, think, I don't think it's very good, but can you take a look at it? And she said, sure. So I brought my 80 type written pages, uh, not very good at the computer in those times. I think I, we actually didn't get our computer until later, but I, I went with my bunch of pa uh, papers and she only checked the first page and she said remember everything we've been talking about punctuation and I said yes <laughs> then she told me then go fix the whole thing and then I will read it <gasps> um, yeah she was very very strict I mean those who knew her won't let me lie so I had two options obey or disobey right do it or not so I said okay I'll do it because she was right I had no idea how to use dialogue uh, so I um, repeated the whole thing, went back, and she told me, yes, this is a good story and we're going to publish it. And so that was my first book ever, Los Guerreros de la Luz, The Warriors of Light. This is the, the first book, then there was a second book, uh, La Fortaleza, because kids wanted more. And now, this year, by God's grace, we'll have the third part, which Jose Carlos is illustrating, and I'm going to give you a sneak peek of his wonderful illustrations. So that's how the book is going to look inside. He's working hard, but he's in lit world, so I don't know how he's <laughs> working right now. He's working hard on finishing the illustrations for the third book, which is coming this year. But uh, I was still carrying a burden. I, I, um, I'm sorry, I was like, I just, I see. he wants to take a picture. And because we are Mexican, we have to stand for each other. <laughs> OK, so uh, I was still carrying a burden. Uh, I have to recognize I was still carrying a burden. It was the burden of expectations, of how my writing life was going to be. And of course, young woman, 20s, um, my big dream was the bestsellers, you know? Uh, for those who speak Spanish, it was El Premio Alfaguara. Uh, that was like my objective in life. But all these expectations made me very tired because, you know, when you write for Jesus, it's not very easy. Writing for Jesus is not easy. And it is then when in 2000 I went to my first Lit World. It was held in England. And I saw a lot of uh, known faith. I mean, I don't want to tell anybody's age. <laughs> it was in 2000, and some of you were there. Uh, and I remember I was one of the 20 year old girls there, very shy. I usually sat at the very back. No, no, I'm not saying anything about people who are sitting in the back, okay? But I was <laughs> sitting in the back, feeling very shy. Fortunately, God sent me two other newbies, and then we were a trio, and that was Ina Reyes from the Philippines, and it was one Buddha from Kenya. And so the three of us were like, we didn't know what to do, how to interact with people, but we learned together. And what I remember the most from Lead World 2000 was Robin Jones, uh, Robin Jones Gunn's workshop where she told us, you need a life verse to guide your writing. And that 
in Lead World 2000, I asked God for that verse. It didn't come immediately. It came a couple of years later. Uh, but one day I was reading the Bible, and uh, I was reading Psalm 40, and I found this verse, Psalm 40:10. I have not kept the good news of your justice hidden in my heart. I have published about your faithfulness and saving power. I have told everyone in the great assembly of your unfailing love and faithfulness. And let me tell you why this was such an important verse for me. In the, when I returned from Lead World, I received an invitation to work for a publishing house, a non-Christian uh, uh, publishing house, that uh, their, main, uh, the, their main trend was uh, self-help books. And they told me, you can write about anything you want, and we're going to pay you all this money. And there were two things I was kind of unsure. The first one was that I was going to be a ghost writer. So I was writing for someone else, and that person was you know, having his name on the cover. But I was okay with that when I saw the numbers. You know, <laughs> the pens. I, I was like, okay with that. But the second thing, I was not okay with that, because they told me, you can mention God. Of course, this is a self-help book. Please mention God. Just never, ever, ever mention Jesus. And that's when I was like, oh, I, I'm not... I'm just not sure what to do. I needed to make a decision. And this verse, this verse totally set my track. If I cannot publish or if I cannot talk or if I cannot declare about God's faithfulness and saving power, then I'm not writing. And of course, I cannot talk about God's saving power without mentioning Jesus. It's just impossible. So I said no. And then there was silence in my publishing life. But it was good. It was good because the burden was removed. I was free from, from that need of uh, knowing what I was going to write about. I knew I was going to write about God. Uh, so I just want to encourage you, if you don't have a life verse yet, that might be a good thing to ask God today to give you the clarity of what he wants you to write about. And uh, I found this beautiful uh, prayer by Robin Lee Hatcher. She's uh, a Christian fiction writer. And she says, Lord, we surrender our writing to you today. It is you who gave us our gifts, our talents, in order to serve you. Our writing doesn't belong to us. It is yours to do with the, as you will. Help us to hold it in an open hand and to be ready to say yes to you, no matter where you call us. So that was my moment in the cross. But then the journey, if you remember the Pilgrim's Progress, the journey goes on. And I want to tell you about two beautiful places that the journey might take you and four difficult places the journey might lead you to. And first, let's start with the good things. Let's start with Palace Beautiful. Christian leaves the city of destruction. He goes to the narrow gate, remember? Then he, yeah, he goes to the cross. He's freed from his burden. And then he arrives to Palace Beautiful. And one quote I found when, uh oh, that the writer explained, uh, or how he envisioned these places, it was like a museum, where you find the rarities of the place. And for me, Palace Beautiful has been Lit World. Uh, so maybe some of you are the rarities <laughs> of the place. <laughs> because it's where you find these wonderful, special people that encourage you. And for me, Lead World has not only been a place where I have been able to grow and to be trained, but to meet people like me and to be encouraged. Like I was not the only writer feeling insecure. Sometimes you go and you're having breakfast with another very insecure writer and you're like, oh, uh, and I don't remember if you remember C.S. Lewis describing friendship like that. It's finding the connection of the, oh, you too, right? And so this is a place where we find people like that. and. Uh, very, very close to uh, the, my first lead world. But I love that picture from MAI. <laughs> uh, very close uh, to that first lead world. John asked me to do my first training. And you have to be very careful with John Most. <laughs> 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 because um, if he's, the, uh, he's an encourager, he is. He definitely is. And I was like, are you kidding me? I haven't even published a lot of books. How can I train others? But I don't remember if he told me that or Bob Ricky told me that, but one of them told me, the little you know is enough. Because you know a little bit more than the others. 
So I encourage many of you that as we go back, we need to share what we have learned because unfortunately, not all the writers in our countries were able to come. Not all the publishers in our countries were able to come. Not all of them will watch the YouTube videos, to be very honest, but we can encourage them. And for me, training has been the palace beautiful. Uh, I am so happy and so blessed because God has given me the opportunity of training writers in Latin America and in other parts of the world, but especially in my uh, mother tongue, you know, in Spanish. And just to see people from Latin America today, it's very exciting for me. I wish to see even more, but if you're in the Palace Beautiful right now, and I think we are, when we go back, let's share with others. Let's not shy away from training because training comes in many ways. But there are difficult places. And uh, Christian very soon faced difficulty heal. A very, very, very uh, difficult place to be in. Uh, I can, I'm going to mention three things that for us in Latin America have been very difficult and that maybe it has, it's the same for some of you in the world. Uh, in Latin America, people don't read. Statistics are super, super depressing. Uh, in Mexico, it's one book a year. Um, TikTok videos, that's, <laughs> that's very high in the list, but uh, books, books. Uh, um, People don't read it. Financial difficulties, as in anywhere, especially uh, one word that can describe Latin America in every nation. I think it's corruption. Uh, our governments are just uh, a mess in most levels, and so there's a lot of corruption. It's very difficult to thrive economically when you have to be um, thinking that everyone is going to ask you to pay extra money for whatever, for printing more books, for sending your books to other uh, countries, etc., and distribution. Even though we are a big, uh, a large continent and we all speak the same language and we can understand each other perfectly well, just getting a book from Argentina to Mexico is so expensive. So publishing houses have big problems. But how do you overcome difficulty heal? Well, one step at a time. One rock, uh, rock by rock, you know? You just keep the next step and the next step and the next step. And we have seen some uh, nice breakthroughs, especially during the pandemic, I want to mention two. The first one is that uh, a network of publishing houses called Letra Viva is planning on doing this reading campaign. And we're starting this May. And I feel very blessed because I was asked to write the book to sponsor this campaign. Uh, it's called Pásame Otro Libro, hand me another book, give me another book. And it's a very easy book that for some of you and in your context, it would be like, do you really need to say that? But we really need to say that in Latin America. Why should we read? Why is it good for you to read, you know? Uh, why should you read to your children before they go to bed? Because in Latin America, that's not part of the culture. So uh, we're hoping to encourage people, especially Christians, to read and buy more Christian books and become a church that reads. And the second thing that has been good in this pandemic is that a lot of publishing houses, especially the small ones, are uh, putting their books on Kindle, on uh, platforms, and so that helps with distribution. So uh, my Argentinian readers um, can read my books, even if it's just a PDF or, or, or through Amazon. But there's a second place that's very dangerous and that I've been there many times, and it's Vanity Fair. Probably you remember this also from the Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, now, Vanity Fair is a very special place to be in because it's the only one that invites you to stay there. Like, nobody would think about staying in Difficulty Hill, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody would think of staying in the Valley of Humiliation. But Vanity Fair seems like a nice, cozy place where you can even, you know, have a house, a small apartment, and get by. Uh, and it might look different for everyone in this room. For me, it looks, now this is my confession, Nicholas. <laughs> I'm going to start with my confession, but for me, it's sometimes that, um, what David was sharing in the devotional the other day, and I think he was talking to my heart, that sometimes we envy other writers, or sometimes we feel jealous of uh, what others get, and we are not good team players uh, because instead of sometimes encourage other writers, we're thinking so much about our own writing and us getting published and, um, you know, 
numbers, statistics, I don't know how that looks for, for you, but one of the things that happens in Vanity Fair in the Pilgrim's Progress is that Christian is um, walking with a friend, Faithful, and Faithful is executed in Vanity Fair. They don't like him. Uh, there's a, a kind of a trial, and if you don't remember, go back home and read the Pilgrim's Progress so, so that things make sense. But uh, there's like this trial and uh, Faithful is the first one to come up front and he's executed. And when I'm in Vanity Fair, it helps me to remember the faithful around me because there are many faithful writers around the world and one of them is actually John Bunyan. I mean, when he was alive, he was not in the bestseller lists. Although today, his book is one of the most widely read in the world. But he didn't get to see that. He didn't get to see the movies. He didn't get to see the new children's versions. He was faithful. So when you're, dis um, when you're discouraged, when you're struggling, remember the faithful. And I have three faithful men to show you right now from Latin America who have been very inspirational to me. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, a la the lady, Lizzie Sice. She's, she's very important, but I wanted just to mention three that have been key in my, uh, in my walk as a writer. And the first one is René Padilla. He's now in heaven, enjoying time with the Lord and with his wife. Uh, and I remember him from Lead World 2008 in Brazil. Uh, sitting down with me to have lunch and telling me about all these no wonderful novels he loved to read and telling me never stop writing fiction even though nobody publishes you. You need to keep writing fiction. And I was like, oh, here is this ooh, theologian, you know, because, I mean, his mind was ooh, way above mine, uh, but encouraging me. And he was faithful. He was faithful. He ran the good race. The other one, is, I don't know if some of you got to meet him, uh, John did. He had like four pen names, Luis de Salem, but his name was Aristomeno Porras. Uh, he wrote a, a weekly newspaper uh, column in one of the most important newspapers in Mexico. He was from Colombia, but he lived in Mexico, and he wrote poetry. And he wrote li these little extracts of the Bible of, the Bible of Christopher Columbus, the Bible of Hernán Cortés, the Bible of, and he tried to show how our Latin American characters were influenced by the Bible somehow. Simón Bolívar, so he had this beautiful section in the newspaper that a lot of people read, and he was the most humble man I've ever met. Uh, we went to have breakfast uh, from time to time with Mrs. Mrs. Isais, we went to his house, and he would sit and he would say, do you want to listen to a poem? And we would be like, sure. And he would just say a poem in Spanish, one of the classics. And um, he was faithful. And the last one, he's even less known. That's my grandpa. <laughs> yeah. um, I think he, he just marked my life in so many ways. So you who are grandparents, you don't know how much influence you can have on your grandchildren, really, believe me. Because for me, he was uh, a hero because I saw his faithfulness. He was faithful in the little things. He wrote many books that nobody knows. He wrote it just for the group of churches he was in. Uh, but he was also uh, a person that I can say, I can say without erring that he was faithful in the little things because I lived uh, I mean, we spent life together. Uh, I am encouraged by the faithful around me. Think about who are the faith faithful around you that you can be encouraged when you are in Vanity Fair. But let's move on. There's also the Valley of Humiliation. Horrible place to be, right? Uh, but it's such a necessary part of the road. When Christian met here the enemy, that's when he really fought against the enemy, literally, Napoleon, the monster who wanted to destroy him, uh, the, the monster, the Apollyon, tells him, I want you dead. I mean, this was not easy warfare. It was direct warfare. And he says, um, um, he tells him all these lies of, you are mine. 
you were in the city of destruction. You're mine. You're not of this new king that you're talking about. Have you seen this new king? So he, he, he gives Christian all these doubts. And um, I think we've all been here. We have been mortally wounded many times by words, by what the enemy whispers to our ears. Uh, and it's, it's a difficult place to be in, the valley of humiliation. But sometimes it's necessary because if not, we stay too much in Vanity Fair, right? But we remember we have received an armor. Christian, uh, in the Pilgrim's Progress, just before he went to the Valley of Humiliation, he had been in Palace Beautiful and he had received an armor, and we have too. So I really encourage you to wear your armor every day because we need it. We need to pray more, we need to read more, we need to spend more time with God. That's the way of surviving the valley of humiliation. And there, then there's the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, I have experienced, like many of you, losses and changes. Uh, I want to mention three particularly that um, have shaped me. Uh, the first one, uh, I was single then, I was not married yet. It was just before Lidwell 2008, like a couple of years before, and I faced depression. Um, this extreme sadness, this extreme sense of not belonging, of not being worth. Um, I was going through a lot of emotional <coughs> ups and downs. Um, I was also, uh, it was affecting my whole body, my health. Um, I didn't want to go to work. Uh, it was a really hard time. Um, and it was a hush-hush time because in Christian circles, you cannot say depression many times, right? You cannot just go and say, oh, hi, I'm depressed. Uh, um, uh, it's a sin, right, for many. It's, uh, you're not spiritual enough. And I was asking God, I'm doing everything. Like, my tick boxes had all checks, you know? Go to church, check. Pray, check. Uh, be a good girl, check. Uh, write books for God, check. I mean... And then I was facing this and I was like, how come this is happening to me if I'm being faithful? But um, probably it was one of the best times of my life too. Because I let God tell me who he thought I was, not who I thought I was. And he told me clearly, patiently, caringly, through friends, through... Um, my family, but especially through scripture, he told me who I am. That I am beloved, that I am a pilgrim, that I am a child of his. The second difficult time, now I was married, and we were in, uh, living in this little um, city in Mexico, and we faced in 2016 uh, an experience with organized crime, which in Mexico is not very surprising, right? But it was the first time it hit close to home. It had to do with family members and all the stories that you've heard, um, kidnapping, um, murder, things like that. So we had to leave our house from one day to the other just to go to a different city. And it was a difficult time for my husband and me. My kids were very small, so they probably don't remember much. But um, it was again a time of loss and of questioning God, why? Again, the checklist, right? <laughs> we're serving you, yeah, we're uh, good Christians, yeah. So why are you moving us? And in such a difficult way, because of course it was very painful and very emotional, but uh, again, it was a good time because God showed my husband and I what was next, and it was ministry. The third time, uh, well, it was in these days that we decided to go to Turkey. And it was one of the best decisions ever because we met the most beautiful people in the world in Turkey. Uh, we were there for four years, beautiful years. Every time we say Turkey or we think of Turkey, we smile and cry <laughs> about things because we miss them so much. But uh, it was a beautiful time. I was working in an international school. My husband was working with refugees. We were so happy. We blended so well with our Turkish um, friends and with the church. But then COVID came, and we were experiencing some health issues. 
So we were thinking we needed to go back to Mexico to just um, check our health. But COVID uh, made everything faster. And so we had to leave in one week. In one week, because the flights were being canceled and canceled and canceled and canceled and canceled. So if we didn't catch the next flight, we were just going to be uh, not able to go to Mexico at all. And, and nobody knew then when airports were going to be opened again. So we just packed uh, four suitcases. Uh, each one, uh, each member of the family had a suitcase. We filled it up. Uh, I just have to tell you this story. I know she's not going to be happy with me, but when we arrived to Mexico, we opened my daughter's suitcase. And guess what? There were no clothes. <laughs> it was full of teddy bears and stuffed animals. <laughs> But all the Winnie Pooh family came to Mexico, so we were happy about that. So, yeah, uh, that was the instruction we gave, and she took it very seriously. Um, my son had a couple of things there, but also soccer cards, and you know. Uh, but again, it was a very difficult time. We, we, we I'm going to be very honest with you because I think that's who I am. But uh, we felt like a failure. We, we felt we have failed. We felt that we, we have failed God, that we have failed our Turkish friends, that we have failed our, our group, our company. Uh, and, and I know that we, have, we were so supported. We were so, so supported by our company. I mean, they were great. But they would tell us these encouraging things, but our hearts were just heavy. And we just felt it was the end. The end of our ministry, the end of everything. Um, lockdown helped. Uh, because um, it gave us time to process things without having to answer many questions or to have to repeat the story over and over again, at least for six or seven months. But the Valley of the Shadow of Death is just not an easy place to be in, and I know that many of you are there today. So let me just share what I have learned, and now I'm going to talk about my son. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's 11. So he's in that age where uh, mommy shouldn't give him kisses or hugs in front of other people, right? So when he goes to, when I drop him to school, it's like, right? Uh, when we're in a mall and I'm like, ah, he's like, and then I have to push back. However, when he's sick or when he falls down, it's okay. It's perfectly okay that mommy goes and gives him a hug and gives him kisses. And I think that that's true in our spiritual lives. When we are in this palace beautiful, when everything's going okay, we might even tell God, not now, I'm with my friends, right? I'm with my colleagues, I'm working, I'm so busy. But it's when we are in the valley of the shadow of the death that we really feel God near us, that we really need his hugs, that we really need his kisses, and that we really need to know that he is with us. So be encouraged if you're facing these uh, times of trouble. Just let God pamper you, hug you, and tell him that he loves you. Because this is the best moment to hear his voice. And I would like to end with the Delectable Mountains, another nice place to be in. The place where you publish books. And I've been very blessed to publish a li um, quite a few uh, children's books. I'm, I, want, I was uh, talking to some friends that I want to write children's fiction because this is not fiction, it's more like non-fiction, but uh, I've written some of them. Uh, I've written for women, uh, biblical um, stories and encouragement for women, uh, devotionals. Um, I, I was very blessed to be trained in one of the best devotional companies in the world, and they taught me a lot about devotionals, and, 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 and now I'm writing that. Uh, my novels, my fiction, uh, most of them happening in Mexico because that's what I know. But uh, there's only one book that I have written that has been a bestseller, only one. And I didn't write it by myself. And so I think this links to the Stronger Together. Uh, let me tell you this story very fast. Uh, I was dreaming with writing a devotional book for teenage girls. And I was sure I couldn't do it on my own. I mean, a devotional book, one, 365 days, that's a lot. And it was the time of the blogs. I don't know if you remember. Everybody was writing a blog, and you were checking everybody's blogs. And, and there was a wonderful friend 
I don't even remember how we met, and I needed, I didn't double check that before the conference, but uh, I was reading all the time Margie's uh, blog. She's here. Margie, can you say hi? Sorry, she's here. I was reading her blog all the time, and she had this other friend, Maida, who was also writing a blog, and I started to read her blog, and, and there was this other friend, Judy, so we wrote a devotional book for teenage girls. And a publishing house, a small publishing house in Mexico accepted to publish it. And we were so happy, we got the 1,000 copies printed only, and then we sold the books because I learned some things. Like when you're publishing and you're, your name is the only one on the cover, it's more difficult to sell than when there are four names in the cover, right? Because then four people are selling to their friends. And so it, it was a very good experience. But we never expected that one day, uh, Chris Garrido from Lifeway, uh, uh, the Spanish division, saw our, our devotional book and he said, you know, I like this. Can I have it? And we were like, well, you have to talk to the publishing house because we, we have a contract with them. But the publishing house was having a lot of financial struggles. So this was, a, this was like a blessing for them because Lifeway was going to pay them a, a lot of uh, money for this devotional. And this helped the publishing house. And then they produced this devotional book, Un Año con Dios, for women. And we still laugh about that because we have some chapters in which it says, and now that you're facing all these changes, because remember, we wrote for teenage girls, right? And uh, maybe you're, you don't like your appearance because you see the pimples in your face. Well, women are reading it. I guess they just skip that teenage part or uh, how to you know, be, be faithful till you find a husband. But uh, it has been in the bestseller list now for four years. And it won uh, Devotional of the Year. So, but what I learned is that it had to be written with someone else. We shared, we sh this is something, uh, it's not like my book, it's our book. And it's so wonderful to say our book. It's such a, and then when I was in Turkey, I had another experience and it was a, I thought I was not gonna write anymore and in Turkish, well, my Turkish is not good at all. But one day uh, I was praying and I was asking God, how can I help the writers in Turkey? I don't even know anyone who writes in Turkey. And then a friend tells me, did you know that this teacher in, in the school um, helps a publishing house? And I'm like, no. And do you know that she is the, actually the one who copy edits everything and is the editor and her Turkish is perfect? I'm like, no. And who is she? And she was my colleague in the homeroom. We were working together with eighth grade. And so I go to her and I tell the students, okay, uh, talk about what you're gonna do next weekend. You know, I'm like, yeah. Uh, and I go like, Daria, I really didn't know you wanted to write. And then two months later, another friend tells me, you know, there's, a, there's this wonderful lady in my church that wants to write and she wants to write children's books. Could you meet her? And I'm like, sure, let's go to Ikea. Because <laughs> that was the closest place to my school, right? <laughs> and so I met Fulia there and they will tell the story now, but they wrote a devotional book. Uh, I was just the one who connected them, but I would like them to come and tell you about this book. So I think marhaba is a common word in many languages, right? Uh, that means uh, hello in Turkish. We are very happy to be here <laughs> and very excited. This is our first international conference and uh, we still can't believe that we are here from 60 different countries, uh, writers, publishers, all together. This is, uh, we are coming from one Muslim country and we are very uh, small community, you know, and uh, we are very small community. And this is amazing. Uh, I want to say very shortly about Turkey. Uh, the population of Turkey is 85 million and uh, only maybe one person or less than one person is Christian. And uh, we are a small community, but uh, we are growing by grace of God. And uh, we have Turkish pastors, Turkish Christian TV channel, thanks God, um, and magazines. Uh, 
But most of the things, sources uh, we use is translating from another languages. So uh, we don't have many local Christian uh, Turkish writers. Uh, I work in publishing office as a proofreader, editor, but all the time I, before doing prof, proofreading, right? Uh, of, uh, from translating from another language to Turkish. So, uh, but we were, we, for me and other women, she has small baby now, she can't come. Um, we wanted to write something that especially in our heart, we wanted to talk to Turkish women. We wanted to write in our own culture, with our own experience. Uh, and, but we didn't know where to start. And uh, then Kayla came, <laughs> God sent her to us. Uh, she gave us hope and encouragement. Uh, she gave us uh, the idea to write a devotional book. But uh, the hardest times of pandemic have been opportunity for us to write. Uh, um, we, uh, did Zoom. we did not see each other long time in Folia. We just uh, did Zoom meetings. We told, yes, we should do this, we should write like this. We didn't see each other long time. All process from Zoom meetings. And um, hardest times of pandemic is very fruitful for us because of this. Uh, but and Kayla mentored, mentoring us nonstop. She prepared all plans, she gave us ideas, she uh, sometimes, um, her Turkish is good, but some parts, for example, she translated and she tried to understand uh, and she gave us ideas. And uh, when our book was ready, we were worried about how we can, how we can print it. And uh, MAI, have to print our book. Uh, I can't tell you how much this encourage, encourage us. We, before we feel very alone, how we can reach to publishers, how we can have one mentor to help us, but we are very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, yeah, my English is not so good. I don't have enough words to explain my feels. In English, I can use maybe 20 words, for explaining exciting, but if I can speak in Turkish, maybe thousands of words. <laughs> but uh, we have common faith language, right? Uh, you can understand my feelings from my emotions, I guess. So thank you so much. Uh, we are very happy and very glad to be here. And my friend Fulia will uh, talk about our book. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Fuya. Uh, I'm also very excited. Uh, same, uh, I agree with uh, Daria. If I will talk in Turkish, uh, you should have to stop me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm really happy to be here with you. Maybe uh, you don't know how to it uh, mean to me, because I haven't seen such a, a big, crowded uh, writers, editors, publishers who has the same heart. Um, I'm really thankful for Kayla and MI Europe who supported us because, yes, we have a desire to write, but we didn't know how to start, how to write. As a woman, uh, being a woman is not easy, especially in our country. There are very less writers, women writers. And so she lead us, she uh, encourage us, you can do it. She gave us an idea. And so we write, uh, we wrote this book. Uh, it's about uh, Proverbs 31, 10, 31, about a virtuous woman. Um, we didn't know each other, Daria, as a man. Uh, so during the pandemic, we made, yes, as Daria said, uh, Zoom meetings. And in these meetings, we uh, shared our testimonies. We know each other's lives shared. And when we read these verses, we thought that it's about a perfect woman. So how can we encourage the other woman? Because she has a perfect life. She's, she looks very perfect. So it can be discouraged to the woman because we can't be like her. So during this journey, we learned a lot of things from God. I learned who, uh, 
what the meaning of being a woman in God's eyes. Because, yes, in the world, they, uh, some uh, thinks or sees us women is weak. But God sees us, we are strong. So we discovered it. So uh, we learned that God uh, doesn't ask to be uh, perfect. He loves us who we are. Amen. Uh, his love is perfect, and his love covers everything. And then we uh, wrote what God touched in our hearts. Um, each day, a verse, uh, and then ask deep questions to the ladies. So make them think deeply. Ask themselves, question their lives, their lives with God. Because God wants us only walk with him. Then he does everything for us. So we found out our identity. We found our worthy. So we want to share this to other women uh, because we feel sometimes unworthy. Because during the pandemic, violence against the women increased. So we, ha we had heart for women. Someone do something for them. Because they also um, grow up the children, new generation. So if they are hopeless, how can they uh, give their children hope? So we want to give the women hope. There is a hope. So this book also, not for only Christian women, uh, we also, it can be read by the non-Christian because we shared our, some experience, some, we gave some uh, samples from our lives. So someone read it, uh, mostly find uh, something near, close to their lives. They feel, I'm not alone. Yes, she lives same thing. If she overcome this problem, I can do it. So we, uh, we wanted to give them um, power and feel strong. So I'm so excited, but I just want to add something. Uh, it's very meaningful for me because it's a miracle to be here for me here. Because uh, I came a Muslim background. I was not very religious Muslim, but if, a, uh, if I talk with a Christian, I become very religious Muslim, <laughs> you know. I was very defensive. I heard the gospel many times, by, but I rejected it every time. And one day, I pick up the Bible and I decided to write a book against the Christianity. I thought that I will read it. I found out the lies and um, the other things about in this book, so maybe it, it will be the big service to Muslims. I was thinking about this. And then I started to read, but something happened too. I, <laughs> I didn't cut on. And a word touched my heart, and I didn't expect it. So make me think deeply, and ask me to some questions, and lead me to seek the God, uh, seek the truth. So change my life, and God changed my heart um, from the writing against the Christianity. You know, now He uses me to uh, use His word to show uh, his love to the others with the words. So it is a miracle. So I think, I think what you wrote, just one word can change someone's life. Thank you. So um, let me just finish with this. I don't know what God is calling you to do today, to help someone, to ask for help, to persevere, to be encouraged, to collaborate. But we all say that Lit World is like a little piece of heaven, so imagine how heaven will be, how the celestial city will, will look like. Um, I don't know what the next part of your journey is, uh, but I do know something. We're getting closer every day <laughs> to the celestial city. Uh, so, what a joy to know. It's not my story, but his story. And what a privilege to be a small paragraph in his story. What a joy to be able to write a little bit about, about the supreme story. And what a privilege to be a sentence 
in your stories. Uh, Bunyan said, so I awoke and behold, it was a dream. But it's not a dream, my friends. May God bless your journeys. Thank you.